Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could I please ask if you would uh, turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? Tonight, we're honored uh, to have a University of Pennsylvania graduate, a journalist, columnist, blogger, author of several books, including but not limited to Primary Colors, well known in this particular place, The Running Mate, The Natural Bill Clinton's Misunderstood Presidency, Politics Lost. Joined time in 2003, did a 2010 road trip from New York to Los Angeles, on a 2011 road trip from Laredo to Minneapolis to learn what voters outside of D.C. are thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Joe Klein in the 2011 road trip to the Clinton School. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back here, Skip. Joe, we're glad to have you. Now, you're on day 11 of this road trip. Yes, I am. You spent eight days in Texas, and you are now on your third day in Arkansas. We'll let you talk about the Texas, and particularly Rick Perry. Uh, but, we would, but in Arkansas, you've been to a town meeting with Mike Ross. You've been interviewed by Craig O'Neill. You have met with Governor Beebe. You've talked with the Tea Party. You've toured the Hope birthplace. What are voters saying? Well, it's interesting. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not far enough into this trip. Let me, let me just explain, step back a bit and explain to you why I do this and why these things started and also how I do it, which is really important. Uh, I have spent a lot of the last 10 years. Um, I was actually retired. Uh, in, I retired in 2000, thought I was going to write more novels. Um, I retired from The New Yorker, which to me was, you know, the ultimate job, best written magazine in the world. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. And I vowed to myself that I had to get back in. I had to really learn Islam, double down on the region. I knew it some really get to know the U.S. military and intelligence. And I've spent a lot of time overseas during the last 10 years, in addition to covering U.S. politics. Uh, I've, I've been on the front lines with our troops. It's been the, most, the greatest privilege of my career. Uh, some of you may know that I wrote a story, a cover story in the magazine about a month ago about the kids coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with a new skill set. Um, for soldiers because they had to be the mayors and the governance of these towns in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And it's my theory that if they can do it over there, they can do it here and we need their can-do optimism, their discipline, their rigor. Um, but I was coming back from one of those trips. I was in, I've been in Afghanistan four times in the last two years. And uh, I was coming back from one of those trips, and I turn on the TV, and I see a lot of people shaking their fists and being very angry out in the middle of America. And I said to myself, is that really what America is about these days? And so I decided to do an old-fashioned thing in a new-fashioned way. Uh, journalists have been taking road trips forever, but I decided that in this era of interactivity that I would put out an all-points bulletin to time readers and show them the route and say, if I'm coming through your state and you have someone you'd really like me to meet, uh, let us know. If there's someone you really respect and admire, you want me to meet, or your coworkers or your family or whatever. And I, and I did, in, in essence, 15 town meetings in 25 days last time. Uh, this time, we not only announced it on, uh, in the magazine, but also on CNN, on John King's show. And we got like 80 responses. And we're going to do 25, 30 of them over the course of this trip. So this is a trip that you, my readers, where you, my readers, set the itinerary. 
one of my readers uh, sitting over here and said, well, if you're going to be coming through Arkansas, you, maybe you could come to the Clinton School and, uh, and, and speak to us. And I said, sure, I'd always, always love doing that. What I'm getting so far, you know, I started in Laredo last week. What I'm getting so far is that there is maybe not so much the, the anger that I saw last year, although I didn't see anger when I traveled across the country as much as I saw anguish, real anguish about the future, about people really worried about their kids doing as well as they have, uh, people really worried about the country sliding back, people really worried about government. That, those feelings have mellowed over the past year. And it's mellowed in an interesting way that a lot of people are, have taken a step back and, and, and have started thinking about first things. Very first you know, meeting I had was down in Laredo with, with, uh, with LULAC, uh, Hispanic American activists. And you know, usually when I've done meetings like this for 42 years now, God help me, and usually when you're meeting with liberal activists, they have a laundry list of things that they, you know, that they really want government to do for them. And in this case, we got past that. There were, you know, they weren't very pleased with Rick Perry's budget cut, uh, education cuts. But very quickly, we got into a, into a really heartfelt discussion about their community and what had happened to the values the conservative social values of the Latino community, family, church, the importance of an education. Too many of their kids were dropping out. They wanted to know, they, they were asking each other, more than me, what's gone wrong? What do we need to get back to where we were? And that seems to me to be the big question in this country right now on all sides. What's gone wrong? What do we need to do to get back to where we were? It's certainly the motivating question um, for, the, for the Tea Party folks I met with last night in, um, you know, in the Arkansas side of Texarkana. Uh, I wrote a column about that that'll appear in the magazine this Friday. Uh, but it's also a really basic, you know, when people look at Washington and they see the mayhem there, uh, they wonder about our very system of government. They wonder about some of the programs that I thought would never be que questioned. Social Security and Medicare. They're asking, is this something that we should be doing as a democracy? To me, the answer to that is obvious, but people are asking these questions. And if we have an election next year in which these first principles are de debated and, and, and exist at the heart of the, uh, the campaign, then I think it would probably be a pretty good thing for the country. But you should know that, and I'm sure you do know, and this is what I'm finding, is that the country is, is in a very serious and sober mood right now and has lost a lot of patience with some of the game playing that they see from our politicians on TV and in Washington. All right. So what, in, what are they saying about Rick Perry? Um, well, it was interesting. I, you know, I, I, I spent some time in Austin over the weekend um, for the music festival. In fact, one of the reasons why I took this route was that eight months ago, I had promised my second son uh, the president of the Austin City Limits Music Festival on the occasion of his 10th wedding anniversary. Um, and uh, in Laredo, the uh, Latinos aren't too thrilled with him because the budget cuts, the education budget cuts, have been pretty draconian. The Republicans, I watched the Republican debate last Monday night with the eight or 12 actual Republicans they have in that county. Uh, it is a very blue county. Um, and they were, had mixed feelings about Perry. You know, they kind of supported him, 
but they weren't entirely convinced yet, which is interesting. Um, when Michelle Bachman, I don't know how many, how many of you watched that debate? I'm just curious. Higher, let's get the hands higher so I could actually see them. Um, well, a fair number of you did. When Michelle Bachman, you know, really came after Perry about requiring inoculations against the sexually transmitted disease that could prevent cervical cancer, um, they were with Bachman, these people, these Republicans in South Texas. Uh, even when Perry said he made a mistake, which I, of course, don't believe he did. I think that you, you know, you want to prevent cervical cancer. And in my experience as the father of a one daughter, I couldn't really count on her to give me an accurate answer when I asked, when I asked her at the age of 14 or 15 or 16. In fact, I didn't even ask her because I knew I wouldn't get an accurate answer. <laughs> Are you sexually active? Um, but anyway, um, and so therefore, I don't know that parents will ever know the correct answer to that question, and so you want to be really careful with the lives of these children. But there was a mixed reaction there. Um, the upside was that Perry was asking these basic questions that are on their minds, like, should we be doing Social Security? Uh, when you got up to Austin, Everybody wanted to know whether I was digging around for dirt on Rick Perry. There are rumors swirling all over the place about all sorts of things. Imagine that about the governor of a state who is running for president. <laughs> I have never been there before. I remember, I remember, by the way, I remember in 1992, the entire press corps was convinced that the very next day, the Los Angeles Times was going to come out with the story about Bill Clinton and cocaine use. Now, I knew Bill Clinton, um, and I knew about his allergies and about the sensitivity of his nose, and I thought, this guy would rather be shot at point black range with a, you know, with a Magnum, 357 Magnum, than, than snort cocaine. Um, but anyway, that rumor existed throughout the entire campaign. There are similar rumors out there right now about Rick Perry, and that is what everybody in Texas is obsessed about. I took a straw poll last night of the Tea Party people, and they were, uh, they, they were all over the map, but, but Perry got the most votes. Um, so I think that he is probably going to be a very formidable candidate. But I got to say, Rick, um, Skip, no, you're not Rick. Bill would be okay, Barack would be okay, but. Skip, I gotta say, I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, uh, here's what I was gonna say. You know, I've, as I said, I've been doing this for 42 years. This is my 10th presidential campaign. There are no 12-step programs for political junkies. Um, and I'm not sure that the Republican Party that we're looking at now is the Republican Party that I've known all my life. The Republican Party I've known all my life believes in primogeniture. You elect the oldest son. You nominate the oldest son. And I'm not sure that that's what the Republican Party is right now. That's the adventure we're on. That's what we're about to find out. Well, okay, in, a, in about a week, uh, Bill Clinton will be here to uh, commemorate the 20th anniversary of his announcement for president October 3rd, 1991. In that campaign, which we'll talk about more mm -hmm. in a minute, um, James Carville said it's the economy stupid. Uh, my question to you is, in 2012, is it the economy stupid again? Well, it wasn't just the economy stupid. It's also something else. I mean, the economy is an important thing. And, you know, people will come with, with all these statistics about how if the, if, if the unemployment rate is over a certain percentage, presidents don't get reelected. I don't believe any of that. I am um, a believer in the theory that you get two human beings standing up on the stage in October, and one seems to be a better leader than the other, and that person gets elected. 
you know, I have a really basic rule um, that uh, warm beats cold and that the better politician always wins. Um, if we're going to have a Barack Obama, Mitt Romney race, it's going to be the most, the, you know, in terms of warm beats cold, it's going to be the most frigid race since George H.W. Bush ran against Michael Dukakis. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but we'll see. The economy is certainly something that is on everybody's mind, and I would argue, I have, I've written it, so I must believe it, um, that the president made an essential mistake. By the way, can I just go off on this for a sec? Why is it? Why? Is, I mean, I interviewed Obama 10 days before the election, and before he was elected, and we talked about a whole bunch of things, and he didn't mention health care once, not once. We talked a lot about the economy. We talked a lot about how it, he believed it was going to be green jobs that would bring the economy back. He said, we're not going to have easy credit anymore in this country. We've got to find something new to drive the economy. We talked about foreign policy. We talked about Bill Clinton. We talked about the, he, he was saying that we need a special rep to deal with Afghanistan, but also to deal with the conflict between India and Pakistan. And I said, you know, that's the kind of thing that Bill Clinton would be great at. Um, and it would also get him out of the country for a while because he and Obama weren't on the best of terms. Um, but then he gets elected and he goes ahead and tries to do health insurance, universal health. He does universal health insurance, even though the statistics say that 80% of the American people are happy with their health insurance. And that, you know, 70% of the American people say that the country's on the wrong track and they're concerned about the economy. Uh, well, Bill Clinton did the same thing when he ran for office, and you know what? The Republicans win in 2010 because people are upset about jobs and the economy, and what do they do? Paul Ryan proposes, you know, gutting Medicare, which 80% of the American people strongly favor. So you got to ask yourself, what are these guys smoking? Um, and. I will answer that question for you right here and now. They are smoking their base. Uh, they are doing what their base wants them to do. And, you know, there are an awful lot of people, you know, I consider myself a flaming moderate. Um, that will be the title of my memoirs if I ever get around to doing it. Um, but, you know, it, it irks me no end as someone who tries to be in the sensible center, um, and sometimes in the radical center, uh, it irks me no end when these politicians get elected and they go off and pay more heed to their base than to the people in, than to the people in the middle, who are the ones who really, in the end, get them elected. Because these elections are about the 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent in the middle, and which way they're going to go. That's, that's what determines them. Okay. This book. Yeah. Anonymous. Yeah. Jack Ooh, Stanton. Yeah. Tell us about how you did it, how you kept it a secret, who you confided in, and maybe what Bill Clinton and you have discussed post-primary colors. Well. This was a very weird experience. Um, I wrote it on Mondays because I was working the other six days a week for Newsweek and for CBS News, CBS TV. Um, and it started when a friend of mine in the administration said to me, these people are a novel. And I thought, hmm, yeah. Uh, but, you know, a journalist writing a novel is the, stupid, is the oldest cliche in the book. Every journalist thinks that they are Dickens waiting to happen, right? And, um, and most of the time when they try it, they don't quite get to Dickens. I even put a picture of Dickens with his children above the, the computer when I started writing this thing um, because I thought to myself, two things I wanted to keep, keep in mind about D Dickens. One was... He had fun with it all the time. He did not write 
that, that, that was the, the key thing. And he did not write for literary critics or for the other people like him in his community. He wrote for the people. Um, and he also made a little money doing it. So I went into this um, anonymously, although I was going to have a pseudonym, um, because of cowardice and whimsy. Cowardice that I thought I would never be able to bring it off. Uh, whimsy, because, um, uh, because my wife and I read a lot of 19th century novels. Jane Austen never put her name on a single thing she wrote. It was Pride and Prejudice by a lady. Um, Dickens was Boz, B-O-Z. Samuel Langhorne Clemens was, as we know, Mark Twain. The first, the first political, um, real, first half decent political novel that was written in this country, Democracy, was written anonymously, but it was by Henry Adams. He wasn't found out until three years after he died. So then I started to write the thing, and weird stuff started to happen. I think in, there was a third, you know, um, in the third chapter, there was a scene at a restaurant based on Doe's. Um, and there was a character there who started to talk, and it was someone who had Mandy Grunwald's job, but the personality of an old girlfriend of mine. And, um, and I wrote in the text, another, in parentheses, another country heard from, just because I wanted to remind myself of that moment. Because all of a sudden, this thing was taking off and going, spinning out of my control. In the very next chapter, a character who had Betsy Wright's job, but not her personality. I didn't even know Betsy Wright. Um, and it, I'd kind of forgotten that she existed. But all of a sudden, there was this six foot, 200 pound lesbian with a mouth on her who was talking through my fingers. Um, and um, I didn't expect that. You know, Skip talk, so at that point, I really wanted to have the book judged on its own merits rather than on my relationship with Bill Clinton, which at that point was going through a bad phase because he had turned left after he had gotten elected. I was, you know, a New Democrat kind of columnist. Um, still sort of am, even though New Democracy has gotten a little old in the tooth, uh, a little long in the tooth. and. Um, you know, I, I didn't know where the book was going. And nobody expected it to be a success. Who did I confide in? I confided in three people. My wife, my agent who sold it, um, and my editor at Newsweek because, the, you know, the, uh, the rules said that you had to tell your editor about any freelance project. And, um, and he said to me, I, he was the first person, second person after my third person, after my wife and 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 and, um, and uh, agent who read it, and he said, "Joe, this is really funny. This is a great book, but you got to understand, things like this never sell." And Random House didn't think it was going to sell either. They kept on dropping the printing week by week by week. They didn't have an author to sell. Who were they going to put out on tour? A ghost? And uh, and then the thing hit like a bomb. And. Um, and it got pretty scary, uh, but the th and I got a lot of criticism from journalists who saw it as a piece of journalism, which it wasn't. Every novel is like this. You, s you work with things that you know, characters you know, um, and then they go off in their own directions. And one conversation I've had, I will tell you, I've had two conversations with Bill Clinton about this book. Now, Clinton never, ever would tell me, would, would talk to me about anything I wrote about him. That was just a basic rule. He would talk to me about things I'd written about other people, but he had a lot of discipline in that regard. And there were times when I wrote things about him that really pissed him off. Um, Obama, on the other hand, will, will mention to me things I wrote about him six months ago. Um, he, you know, they all have, a, they, they have photographic memories for things when you criticize them. You know, Biden has, has mentioned to me things I wrote about him 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the first time Clinton and I talked about this was at the end of his presidency, uh, I decided to do a, this was the seeds of my book, The Natural. Uh, I was working for The New Yorker, and I decided to go back through the eight years and see what he'd actually accomplished in between all of the scandals. 
And he found out about this and he said, I really want to be part of that. And so we did a series of interviews. And after the first one, um, which was about health care and welfare reform, it was an hour and 45 minutes. It was really intense because we're both policy wonks. And we had, had these, been having these conversations at that point for 15 years, now for 25. Um, and um, it was over. The first lady walks in. And we're just kind of, we're feeling great. And he said to me, Joe, why'd you write that book anyway? And I said, well, Mr. President, I always saw it as a tribute to larger than life politicians. At which point, Hillary snorted derisively. And I said to her, but first lady, would you rather have a larger than life president or a smaller than life president? And um, at that point, she was looking at a choice between Al Gore, whom she hated, and George W. Bush, whom she disdained. And she shrugged her shoulders and said, yeah, you know, I, I get it. And I said, and you realize that when you're going with a larger than life character, they have larger than life strengths and larger than life weaknesses. And she looked at me, she looked at him, she started laughing and she said, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that was the first conversation. The second conversation was he and I were, we might have been at Dick Holbrook's house for a party and we just started talking about things. We, and we started talking about, and, and I said to him, you know, the gimmick in primary colors was going to be that Jack Stanton was going to lose, but he just wouldn't. I kept on throwing all kinds of stuff at him and somehow the guy would wriggle out of it every time. And he sent me a very nice note afterwards thanking me for making sure that Jack Stanton didn't lose. Um, but that guy wasn't going to lose. You know that. This was the best. It was based on, inspired by, the very best politician, very best stand-up politician I have covered in 42 years of doing this. Wow. Okay. By the way, one other thing, one other thing, when, when Mike Nichols bought the movie rights to this, I was still anonymous. He said something that made me realize that he understood the book. He said that he really liked this piece because there were no villains in it. And that's the way I wrote it. I didn't see Jack Stanton as a villain. I saw him as a politician. And as I was just saying to your governor, I really like good politicians. I don't think our country has enough of them. We really need good, smart politicians. Okay, I'm going to do a real quick run through here, and then we're going to throw it open to the audience because I know there are a lot of questions, and we got a lot of students here. Um, you know, you blog and all this. Uh, you know, I like tweeting. You like tweeting? Yeah, I like tweeting. And so I'm going to throw out a name to you or a phrase, and you've got 140 characters to give me an answer, which means a sentence or two. So when I say the name, you, give, you pretend like that you can, you're tweeting, okay? I don't tweet, though. I know you don't, but you got this. this novel, I think we're oversimplifying this, the stuff this, that we, we do as journalists far too much as it I is. Know, but, I find... I find... I find television hard. Okay. Well, just now that we've trashed tweeting, uh, <laughs> the Buffett rule. You didn't rule. have me here to just agree I with know. everything. The Buffett rule. The Buffett rule? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the obvious answer is of course, but the real answer is that it should be lower than that. Okay. That we should that we should go back to the we really should go back to the Clinton tax rates in the 1990s because as you know you as you all remember the Great Depression of the 1990s that those tax rates brought. Uh, I mean I keep on asking this of Republicans. Um, I keep on I'm already over the 140. That's all right. You've but, already, don't but, worry. You already trashed tweeting anyway, so it doesn't matter. You know, I remember I was sitting down with Grover Norquist. And um, there was a groan back there. <laughs> you know, I mean, Grover Norquist, I, this is how far we've gone in this country. Grover Norquist actually is willing to say to me when I asked him about the no tax press, uh, no tax pledge, he said, 
I saw it as a really good marketing tool. This is our country, for God's sakes. This is our government. This is our kids' future. And he's mucking up with it and with, you know, because of the, it's a good marketing tool? I said, well, but Grover, your guy, Reagan, raised taxes three times. In 1982, he had the largest percentage tax increase still in American history, and almost all of it was on businesses, which we all agree probably isn't the right way to go in any case. And then the economy boomed. And then Bill Clinton raised taxes, and the economy boomed. So what do you make of that, Grover Norquist? And he says, well, I don't emphasize that part of the argument. <laughs> he said, I, I, what I'm just interested in is making government smaller, and this is one way to do that. Okay, Dick Cheney's book. Not even worthy to be a doorstop in my house. Print journalism. I hope we survive. Um, some of the finest people I know have been print journalists, and they work really hard, especially the ones overseas. Um, I, she gets really embarrassed when I do this, but I'm traveling with a, a truly great photographer, Lindsay Adario, who has spent the last, this is the first time she's shooting in the States in 12 years. She spent the last 12 years covering wars and tough situations overseas. I know a lot of people like Lindsay. Um, and when Sarah Palin calls them, me, us, the lamestream media, that's pretty lame. Because if you don't have us, if you don't have institutions like the New York Times and Time Magazine, you have the rule of anarchy in terms of the information that you're getting. So I sure as hell hope we survive. The death of Osama bin Laden. Well, I think it really is cool that the you know that this Muslim um, uh, socialist radical president got rid of that guy. College football. I'm from New York. <laughs> <laughs> How about them jets? <laughs> All right. Hillary Clinton. A truly great public servant. I have traveled with her recently as Secretary of State. Um, my sense is, from people who know her, that she's pretty tired right now. She won't do a second term. And she's saying she won't run for president in 2016. But I don't know that that'll be the case. 2016, she'll be 68 years old, which was younger than Ronald Reagan, and she is a woman, which means she plays younger still. Um, and she will have a resume unlike any other human being in this country. Um, and I think she's learned an awful lot. I would be willing to bet you, I'm probably talking out of school now, but I am willing to bet you that if she had gotten the nomination and been elected president, she would not have gone for universal health insurance because she'd been there and done that, and she would have focused. You remember, I mean, I was over at the governor's mansion today, and I was thinking, all of a sudden it popped into my mind, the first interview Bill Clinton did after he was elected, it was with Ted Koppel. You remember Ted Koppel. I miss Ted Koppel. Um, and what was the sound bite that came out of that interview? It was, I'm going to focus on the economy like a laser beam, which so it kind of surprised me when he focused on health care the way he did. But I think she would have remembered that, and she would have focused on the economy, on this economy, like a laser beam. Mike Beebe. How on earth does a Democrat in a place like this have an 82% approval rating? 70% <laughs> among Tea Partiers. He must have mesmerized this state, cast a spell. Mike Huckabee. 
I don't think that, you know, this country is many things and it's often foolish about things, but I don't think that anybody who has questions about the theory of evolution is going to be elected president of the United States in the 21st century. If you had to call it today, who wins in 2012? Well, I've grown very humble over the years. I don't even know who's going to win the Republican nomination. You remember that four years ago, right now, four years ago September, John McCain was dead. There was no chance he was going to win the Republican nomination. Eight years ago, John Kerry was dead. Howard Dean was the flavor of the moment. All of my colleagues were saying, it's over. So I just don't, I, I really don't know. You've got to tell me who Obama's going to be standing up against. Um, I will say that I am, I am concerned that he doesn't love the game enough. Um, you know, he ain't going to have to love the game too much because this is a very weak Republican field. But you really have to love this competition to succeed at it. And he seemed to do it last time, but it was kind of a slam dunk last time. Um, I just don't know who's going to win. Your turn. Everybody, raise your hands. Questions. Let's wait for the microphone to get to you. Let's see. We'll have one right here. Zach, we'll wait for the. Okay. We'll wait for the, wait for the, wait, wait for the mic. The question was: Is Rick was, Perry a good politician? I don't know yet. You know, he can't. He comes across as strong and forceful, but you know, when when I, when Michelle Bachman swung a right hook at him, and it was a very right hook, um, he seemed to have a glass jaw. He went from forceful to deer in the head headlights very quickly. He went from hunter to prey, you know, like in a nanosecond. And so I don't know, you know. We're just getting to know this guy. Uh, we got one in the back here, Bill. Uh, student, right? Mark Peters has a question in the back. That's great. And while he's doing it, let me just say that I really think that the idea of this graduate school um, is one of the best new ideas in higher education that I have seen in this country. Thank you. And you guys, Thank you. Skip, Thank you. you should be proud of this. Arkansas should be proud of this. You guys are going to make a difference. Uh, my name is Mark Peters. I'm a second year student here. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. I was curious, in your recent article in uh, the actual magazine, not the blog, you talked about a documentary you screened with LULAC about a school that was being built in Kenya. And they were reacting about like how our students don't have as much of an investment and ownership of their education. Um, and I was wondering if you could delve a little bit into like how we can create that uh, level of investment, level of ownership. I can't do that one in 140 characters or less. <laughs> but I do think that this is you know I create one of the characters in. Um, uh, in primary colors was, I, his name was a reference to this problem. Orlando Ozio, the, uh, the governor of New York. Machiavelli once said that Ozio is the greatest enemy of a republic. Um, what's Ozio? It's Italian for indolence. What Machiavelli was worried about was how do you keep a society, a republic, coherent when it's not at war? People get lazy. They start going off and doing this and that. Um, and we have had you know, a 60-year experiment in Ozio like the world has never seen. You know, we've had wars, but they weren't all con consuming wars like World War II. And we've had prosperity. We've had recessions, but they weren't major ones until this one. And now in the course of the last 10 years, we've found that we're not as safe as we thought we were because of terrorism, and that our economy isn't destined to be the greatest in the world forever unless we do something about it. And in the course of that time, another thing has happened. There's been a kind of retribalization of American society. When I was a kid, and a lot of you looking at the color of your hair probably were kids around the same time I was, um, we only had three flavors of ice cream, if you remember, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry. Um, there was no chunky monkey. 
right? Um, and we only had three networks. Everybody watched I Love Lucy on, Lucy on Tuesday night, right? Now we have a thousand channels of nothing. And, you know, we've kind of re-tribalized ourselves. My daughter is a member of the MTV tribe. My father's a member of the ESPN tribe. I'm obviously a member of the C-SPAN uh, CNN tribe. And in the course of that, we've lost our town square. We've lost our unity as a society. And we have to figure out how to get there. And, you know, in all of the bad news, there has been, I see one counter indicator, uh, and that is young people like you, uh, and especially the young people I met in the military who are coming back and I think are gonna be the new greatest generation. Um, they're, gonna, you're gonna, they're gonna be presidents in this group. They are coming back and they look at this society and they are not thrilled with we baby boomers. Um, they are coming back with a sense of discipline and mission and rigor. You know, I look at them and they are, they have a lot of the qualities that we've lost as a society. And I will add one other thing, that the military has a lot of the qualities that we, we've lost as a society. And especially now that the military has become a very different institution than it was 10 years ago because of counterinsurgency warfare. The training has changed, in large part because of David Petraeus, who was my mentor in this, thank God. Um, and it's no longer yes or no, sir, I'll take that hill, sir. Now, if you're a captain, you're given a mission, and the way you fulfill that mission is up to you. These people are creative and they're entrepreneurial. I saw captains overseas, you know, they had money, unlike State Department people, just ask Hillary Clinton, just ask my son who is a diplomat in Hillary Clinton's foreign service. Um, these people, these captains had money and, and I remember in this one town in Afghanistan, um, he crowdsourced how the money was going to be spent. He went to the people and said, look, we can clean out the irrigation system or we could reopen the school or there's a road north of town that some people want to have paved. What do you think? And then he took these options to the city council, to the Shura. And, you know, and they eventually decided they wanted to have the, the school reopened, which became a real ordeal because the Taliban had closed that school. But those are the kind of skills that we really need in this society. Those are the kind of skills that are going to bring back a sense of community. We really have to get education and the education our kids are getting to a much, much better place than it is now. And we all really have to start working harder. Uh, yes, we got a question right here on the front row. Let me just hand you mine. It's easier than... You called yourself a... I believe you said flaming moderate. Is, yeah. Is this a, well, I call myself a flaming liberal, but I'm also very pragmatic. I know that the country cannot, you know, run, be run the way that I would like it to run because everybody's not like me. We have to meet in the middle. And, you know, that was one thing that I love about President Clinton because that's, you know, he realized that you said he might have went left a time or two, but he ran the country from the middle. So my, my question is, all right, Obama, a lot of the Tea Party people will say, you know, he, he is a socialist and he's too liberal and all this kind of stuff. Being a, a very liberal person, he's not near liberal enough for me. So do, since you're doing this road trip and you're talking to people, do people really believe that Obama is that liberal or do they see that he is more pragmatic, more running from the center, governing from the center? And, and kind of an add on to that, the way the media is, of course, we hear a lot about the Tea Party. They love to play that up. They love sensationalism. Mm -hmm. How much does the real country, the middle of the country, are, are they going along with their values? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And then I'm going to have a question for you after I answer this. Um, so far this trip, I've been meeting you know, with more partisans. Uh, that's going to change over the next few days. Last year, when I was out in the, in the country, um, the feelings about the president were affectionate. They like the guy and respectful. They think he's smart. 
but they also think he is ineffective and doesn't care about them, and they do not know what he has done. The only things they know about the health care plan are the things that aren't in it, that the Republicans claim that are, like death panels. They have no idea what the financial regulatory reform bill was about. Um, the stimulus last year they were just beginning to get because of, um, because of the, you know, the, all those road crews were out and making their commute to work that much harder. So they weren't thrilled about that, but at least they knew that the money was going to create some jobs. And that was belatedly so. Up in the Midwest, in a lot of, part of, the, a lot of, in a lot of the country uh, that you know, relates to the auto industry, they really like the auto industry bailouts. Um, most people have no idea why the banks were bailed out. Um, and I lay a lot of this at the president's feet. I, you know, I think that it's on him to explain what he's doing. I mean, he's the first politician I've ever covered who gives people tax cuts and doesn't tell them about it. I mean, you know, I was at a town meeting in Yuba City, California last year. Guy gets up and says, my mom is in assisted living, but she's really proud and she likes to keep her own checkbook. And she got $250 direct deposited a couple of weeks ago and she didn't know where it came from, so she asked me to try and find out. And it turned out to be the $250 from the federal government um, to fill the donut hole, for prescription drugs donut hole, for, you know, Medicare donut hole. Now, if Bill Clinton were president and he had done that, he would have run up to a senior sen citizen center with one of those gigantic publisher's clearinghouse checks for $250 and a bag of donuts. He would have gotten it across. Um, Vegan so, donuts now. What? Vegan donuts. Vegan donuts now. Man, you know, I've known this guy for 25 years, and that is the most mystifying thing I've, he's ever done, he's done yet. Bill Clinton, a vegan? All right, yes, sir, there's a question right here. Pass the microphone down here, Bill, please. I wanted to ask if you've read the analysis of the political, of the Republican Party by Mike Lofgren, the congressional staffer. It's a, I asked because John Brummett said it was the most significant piece of political commentary of our time. It was written about 10 days ago. Uh, no, I've been on the road for 10 days, but, I, but if you say so, I will. Well, John, what, John Brummett says so. <laughs> what is it? Mike what, Lofgren was a, uh, uh, for 28 years, a, a Republican congressional staffer for the Senate and House Finance Committees. And this article has gotten a lot of circulation, and it is about a 10-page analysis of the Republican Party and essentially his deep problems with it after having been on that side mm -hmm. for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to, to the liberal. <laughs> um, and I got to say, you know, one thing that I've gotten, that I got yesterday uh, from both the Tea Party people and the mayor of Hope is the, and this is something that, that, that I think liberals don't think about nearly often enough but should be job one for any Democratic president. They were complaining about the Dodd-Frank financial regulatory reform bill. And one guy, one of the Tea Party guys, uh, and this is why he was angry, but he seemed a pretty straight shooter. He was a, he, he ran construction company and did some real estate, commercial real estate developing down in Texarkana. And he said, you know, in the past, uh, I was able to get what they call character loans. Um, I was known in town. The bank knew my record. I would always pay, repay a loan. He said, recently, I had this deal that, was, that had to be done quickly. And I go to my banker, and they said, sorry, we can't do it because of Dodd-Frank. The process now takes six weeks. He said, I lost that deal. I lost the construction jobs that came with that deal. Um, I think that it's incumbent on liberals, if you want to have a government that does things, it's got to do them well. I mean, I wrote a column earlier this summer that really pissed off a lot of liberals. 
It was about Head Start, which after 40 years in existence, finally, finally, the government agency that ran Head Start did a study of it, a comprehensive study of it, of its educational results and its social results. And it found that Head Start made no difference at all. None. Zero. Previous studies of pilot projects that had been run by early childhood experts showed that Head Start made a lot of difference. But when, you, when it was taken to scale, Head Start is like the last vestige of the great society. Nearly half of the Head Start programs in this country are run by community action agencies, which were next thing to corrupt 40 years ago. And they have now become, they have made Head Start into a jobs program for their friends. Now this is $7 billion a year, drop in the bucket compared to other things. But I truly believe that if this country is going to be great, we're going to need programs like Head Start to bring up our poorest kids. And liberals, if they believe in this, cannot be in denial about it. They have to be the people fighting hardest to take those programs away from community action agencies and put them in the hands of people who actually know what they're doing. Because as long as this nonsense goes on, the Tea Party people in the, in the country are going to have a really pretty good argument. So, I mean, if you're going to be a liberal, it's incumbent on you to think of the M part of OMB an awful lot. Management. It's the job number one for any Democratic president. Um, Bill Clinton came in knowing that, but then forgot it and then remembered it again with reinventing government. Um, Obama, to this day, I don't think really gets it. Second row. Hold on, wait for the microphone, Richard. Do you, have, do you have meetings or things planned the next few days that w one might come as an observer and watch you work? Yeah, but I don't want you. Okay. <laughs> the Arkansas Dentists Association have reached out to me and they're putting together a group of people upstate, um, which is going to be interesting. Yes, ma'am, there's a question right there. I read this afternoon that Lamar Alexander had resigned his leadership position in order to be able to compromise and work with other senators. Have you heard that? And if so, do you think it's going to work, that he's going to get any cooperation and get something done? Well, you know, that's a, did everybody hear that? That's an important thing. You know, I've known Lamar for 20 years now, and, um, and I had to whoop him upside the head a couple of times in print over the last f five years um, because, of, because of statements he made and statements he didn't make that I know he didn't believe and things that he didn't say that I knew he did believe. And I think it's a really good sign that people like Lamar Alexander and Tom Coburn and others, um, the guy I'm looking for is the Republican, the new Republican senator from Ohio, uh, former budget director, I'm 65 years old, aphasia, Port Rob, Port Rob Portman. I would like to see him involved in this too because this guy has an awful lot of economic credibility. but. All of my colleagues are saying that the jobs bill is dead on arrival and that a, a big deficit deal is dead on arrival. I may be crazy. In fact, I know I'm crazy because I'm still doing this instead of writing novels. But, you know, the reason why I do it is because I'm a romantic and I want to see the great moments rather than seeing these guys screw up. I mean, they screw up all the time. That's not news. But a moment when Lamar Alexander and several other Republicans step out when a gang of six forms and actually gets something accomplished. Those are the moments I live for. And we need a moment like that in this country right now. We need... 
We need the deficit deal. We need um, something like the stimulus package that the, the president um, has proposed. And, and can you imagine this? The guy proposing, the Republicans are opposing lower taxes. Um, might be because it's the middle class that's going to benefit from this, but they're saying that they're opposing them because these are only temporary tax cuts, and they're only in favor of permanent tax cuts. Well, the Bush tax cuts were temporary, right? I mean, the tortured explanations that we're getting from some of these folks. By the way, the Republicans, and, and you know, the, this, the spectrum has shifted so far to the right that, you know, Moderates are now people who, um, who, who believe that, well, I, I got to think that through. Someone like me is a flaming liberal as far as, 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 far as you know, the Republicans are concerned. Joe, the, one of the things that, that I've seen, you talk about that, but in the Arkansas legislature, we're seeing you know, very uh, talented young people coming and running and winning as Republicans. Matthew Shepard from El Dorado is an example. Davy Carter from Cabot is an example. There are several. It seems to me that that uh, you know, that as, as, as some people that are that are critical of the Republican Party, um, as you talked about the young veterans coming home and making big differences as as leaders. Um, I wish you would look as you travel the country to see if if this candidate recruitment and these young leaders, because clearly in Arkansas, there are some really, really talented young people uh, being elected to office as Republicans. And uh, I wonder if that's a trend across the country. Well, I don't know that it's a trend across the country, but I do know that um, a lot of the young military folks that I'm talking to, a really interesting thing in this regard, by the way, it's the Democratic Party that has set up institutions to recruit these people on the national, national level. There is a thing called the Truman National Security Project, which this is how pathetic the Democratic Party is. It was, the Truman was originally founded to school new congressmen and women on the military. You know, to tell them like a lieutenant is higher than a sergeant, you know, a brigade is bigger than a battalion, that kind of stuff. Um, but they started recruit. They 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 have like ten or twelve Truman Fellows every year. Most of them are military, former military. Some of them are diplomats like my son, although he hasn't done this yet. Um, and uh, and these are some of the most spectacular people I I have met. Um, the other institution that's really interesting that has come out of the Democratic Party is that the very hottest, most active and interesting military think tank in Washington right now is a Democratic think tank called the Center for New American Security. It was founded um, by a lot of the people, it's populated by a lot of the people who surrounded David Petraeus. Um, and believe in counterinsurgency. I always thought that counterinsurgency was kind of a democratic way of going about war. It's essentially community policing with air cover um, and, uh, and social services thrown in. Um, by the way, all those Republicans who see David Petraeus as a potential president, I'm gonna be really interested to see what they think about him when he starts talking about stuff. <laughs> because he is, he may well be a Republican but he is not a Tea Party Republican, that's for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give a round of applause to Joe Klein. I didn't know we were over. Thank you for coming out in these numbers. I really appreciate it.